Hi, welcome and welcome back to the Black Spruce Knitting Podcast. My name is Allie and I live in Vermont um, in the United States on Abenaki land and I live here with my partner Chris and our dog Darwin. Um, Darwin is joining me today um, and it's been a while. I'm so happy to be back for another podcast. I um, have been sort of taking a break this summer because I've been knitting a wedding dress. Chris and I are planning to get married in October and I really wanted to get married in a garment that I've made. But knitting a wedding dress is a really big project so I haven't been sharing it. Um, I'm going to hopefully share it when it's done if it works out. Um, so far it's going well. I'm almost done with the skirt um, and I'm gonna do the bodice next. But um, it's just a really big project. So I I'm not going to show you that today, but what I did want to share is that I have a couple projects that I've been working on when I take breaks from the dress. Um, I haven't finished anything. Um, because the dress is kind of a push, I'm not pushing myself very hard with other projects, but they still might be interesting and I can talk a little bit about sort of why I made them and, you know, what what sort of um, inspired each project. So I have three unfinished projects to show you. Um, I don't have any new yarn, but I do have some new fiber for spinning that I want to talk about. And then I thought that I could show you our garden and what we're sort of doing outside, um, if it's interesting. So um, if you wanna hear about <laughs> all of the ways that I've been procrastinating, on knitting my wedding dress, stick around. One last thing before um, I talk about yarn is that I just wanted to let you all know that I've been not really using Instagram very much recently and I've been, um, I just have been, been very good at online communication and I just wanted to apologize for that. Um, I have just been really occupied um, and so if I've missed anything, I will check soon. And if you need to get in touch with me, please leave a YouTube comment and um, I can send you an email address, um, which I check more frequently. Um, yeah, there's just been a lot going on um, this summer. So yeah. So the first project that I've been working on is I mentioned previously that I did a yarn trade with wonderful Liza from the Volblum podcast. And this was one of the yarns that she sent me. The dyer is Naughty Habit. It's a South African yarn. It's 90% superwash merino and 10% linen, and it's single ply, and it is so soft. It's this beautiful stony gray color with these speckles. It's so neutral um, and earthy. Um, the colorway is olive. And I had to cast on with this right away. I decided also that I wanted to make a lace project because I knew that I would be knitting a lace wedding dress and I wanted some practice. So what I cast on is this. This is the Etude by Ruriko. And it's this beautiful sweater with this like incredible lace yoke. And it has A-line shaping in the body, but I decided just to do the body straight. And I've pretty much finished the body. I just need to do some bottom, um, I think it's ribbing. I need to just do the bottom border and then add the sleeves. And I took a break from this because I was waiting for nine inch circulars for the sleeves, which I now have. So I should pick this up again when I need um, a break from the dress. But I thought that this would be a great lace practice project because I've done lace in the past, like when I was younger, probably like five or more years ago, maybe even 10 years ago. Um, and I've always gotten really frustrated knitting lace. It's harder to fix your mistakes. Um, I now know that you can use lifelines so you can thread a piece of uh, waste yarn through your stitches, which will help you rip back if you need to. Um, but I've actually also found that I'm just not making as many mistakes and that I can fix them um, more quickly. Um, which is cool to see. I don't know that I had realized that my knitting skills had improved that much, but lace feels a lot more doable. And this lace project is really cool. It's not complicated. I can't remember which stitches it uses because I knit this actually probably like two months ago. <laughs> um, but 
Um, none of it's very complicated. I feel like it would be pretty doable for a lace beginner. I would consider myself really pretty beginner at lace. Um, but each row does change, but it's also changes in a way that makes sense so that you can, you don't have to always be looking at the chart. Um, you know, usually I don't do like a roll neck neckline on my pieces, but I love how it looks on this one. There's some short row shaping. So the rolled neck is just a little bit thicker in the back. And um, I just raced through this yoke and it definitely gave me the confidence to begin knitting the dress. And I've also tried this on and I love the way that it fits. So I'm really excited. I feel like I'm gonna wear this. I think because of the linen, it could be a great sweater for winter and for cold weather, but I think I could also wear it in slightly warmer weather as well. Um, the yarn is a dream to work with. It has just a beautiful drape, um, which Eliza, I think, had said that this was one of her, or maybe her favorite base, and it does not disappoint. Um, I will say it's sort of an interesting single ply um, because it feels like it's not super tightly twisted. And when I was casting on, I tend to use a twisted German cast on, it's kind of just my default. I really like how it looks. Um, at first I was having a problem with the yarn untwisting, which was sort of interesting, but I was able to figure it out, you know, because with a twisted German cast on, you're twisting the yarn. <laughs> and so I was just untwisting um, and it was getting puffy, but like, and you know, when yarn loses its twist, it's not as strong, but I was able to sort of figure it out if you have two strands every once in a while, I would just switch them and it solved the problem. <laughs> um, and I haven't had any issues with the yarn untwisting since the cast on. Um, I think because it's a single ply and because it's, you know, it, it feels, I, I feel like it will stand up to wear, but I also think I wanna be very careful with how I wear this um, just because I really love this yarn and I think this garment is very beautiful and I want to take care of it. So I definitely will be thoughtful when I wear this. Um, oftentimes when I am wearing garments, um, I can be kind of hard on them. <laughs> you know, I'll like go hiking in a knit sweater, but that's good I think for lopi um, or let lopi and maybe not as good for a yarn that's single ply. So yeah, I can't say enough good things about this yarn. And it's a beautifully written pattern. You know, I haven't found a single mistake in it. Um, I think it's gorgeous. And I think doing the sleeves on the nine inch circulars, excuse me, I'm like a little horse this morning. Doing the, the sleeves on the nine inch circulars will be fun and it will go quickly and it will be great TV knitting. So yeah, this was just, I think, Sometimes if you're intimidated about a big project, doing a smaller project with some of the same techniques is just a really great way to um, test some things out and figure out what you need. This was a way for me to figure out that actually I don't really like using lifelines because um, it sort of can be, hi, um, it can sort of be like, it's hard for me to like keep them in and I just, you know, I ended up fixing mistakes as they come up and I'm sure there are some mistakes still in there that you could find if you looked. Um, but it, it's easier for me to fix lace mistakes as they come up unless something has gone very wrong. So, oh yeah, I think I'm knitting this on the called for needles, which I think is size three and four. I didn't swatch for this, which is unusual for me. I swatch for almost everything. Um, and I know that this will grow. It fits me really well now, but I'm sure it's going to grow when I block it, um, especially given that it's lace and, you know, lace blocks out and you can see the pattern more clearly. Um, but I feel comfortable with this being a garment with a good amount of positive ease and just sort of light and flowy um, and dreamy. I am really into light, the light colors. Um, so I'm not super worried about it blocking out to be too big, but it is interesting that I didn't swatch. I almost, I almost always swatch for sweaters. Um, maybe I'm just getting a little more bold. I don't know. 
so yeah thank you again Liza for this this lovely lovely yarn um, I am really excited to finish this and now that I have the right needles it's going to be not a priority because again I have to work on the dress but next time I'm reaching for something I want to reach for this the next project that I worked on was a really small sock project because I wanted to have something to knit on while I took a class at Yestermorrow, which is a design build school in Vermont. Um, I took the class of women's carpentry. Um, it was amazing. I will put a couple pictures that don't show anybody's faces of the shed that we built together. Um, I have no carpentry experience and want to learn to build things. Eventually I'd like to build buildings, but I want to be able to do projects around my house more easily. Um, I especially wanted confidence using saws because saws used to scare me. I now feel really confident using saws. <laughs> I actually think I dreamt about sawing last night. Um, I learned so many things. I just, I think it was a thousand dollars for the week. Um, which is obviously really expensive, but you know, um, I took the week off of work. If you are like me and you want to learn carpentry and you don't have anyone to teach you, I just can't recommend Yes Tomorrow enough. They also have um, like eco design classes. I think there was like a rain garden design class happening at the same time as ours. Um, and the people in the class were wonderful. It was just a great experience. So um i knit a sock during the class um especially during the lectures like we had lectures on nails and lumber and um i'm trying to think of other things and just like framing and all of the things that you think about when you are framing or when you're pouring concrete for a basement and i need to have my hands going um and so i just knit a vanilla sock 64 stitches three by one cuff slip stitch heel and gusset and I knit most of it on nine inch circulars um, because I just wanted something that was really mindless so that I could focus and this yarn is less traveled yarn I think it's their 747 sock base the colorway is divination and I had ordered this yarn for my casio shawl that I knit last year it was a mystery knit along by Anna Johanna um, but I ended up using some of my own hand dyed yarn instead that was pretty similar to this and I'm trying to knit through my stash I'm trying to use up my sock yarns so um, I just grabbed this didn't fuss around with different color <laughs> heel or cuff just so simple um, yeah and it was great it was really helpful during the class to knit um you may have gathered by this point i'm not really much of a sock knitter i almost never finish socks i often knit them two at a time because then i actually will finish a pair um but you know this just needed to be a project for something to do with my hands so i'm sure i'll finish it eventually i don't know when um but it's just a vanilla sock. I did switch to bigger needles for the heel flap and the gusset. Is there anything else to say? I don't think so. Just that that carpentry class was really, really excellent. And, you know, it was basically my vacation this summer. We're not really going anywhere. Um, and yeah, they have housing if you don't live in Vermont and they have meals. It's just such a cool place um so i'll definitely pop a link because i'm sure there are some people here who like me never got to learn how to do carpentry um the class is carpentry for women it's for women and non-binary folks and they also have classes for people of all genders as well um if you are a man who wants to take a carpentry class that exists as well and i've heard that the classes that are for people of all genders are also really chill and wonderful um but it was really interesting to hear in our class that so many older folks because of their gender hadn't had the opportunity to take shop class when they were a kid um so i don't know it was cool we had folks of all ages in it it was just 
great experience. So yeah, carpentry vanilla sock. <laughs> so the last project that I'm gonna show you, and I will pop a picture of the yarn here. Um, this project was a two-parter because first I spun this yarn from three braids of fiber from Emily C. Jillies in this colorways epilogue. And I spun this yarn really purposefully because I had an idea in my mind of doing a really long gradient with a little bit of marling. So I didn't want to chain ply the yarn, which is when you ply it on itself and you have very consistent color. What I did instead was that I took each braid and I spun one ply and then I plied the three plies together so that the yarn would have this really slow gradient. Um, but have some marling. So some places where the color is solid and then some places where one ply has changed to another color more quickly. And I knew that I wanted to make a semicircular shawl out of this yarn. The fiber is Rambouillet, which is I think like a North American type of like merino relative. Um, so it's very, very soft. And I wanted this big circular shawl with a gradient. So I started researching different ways to make circular shawls. One of my goals is to knit without a pattern or with just recipes more often. And I was reading in my Vogue book of knitting about half pie shawls, which is when you have a shawl where every increase round you double the stitches and then you're doubling the amount of rows in between increase rows. Um, so you do an increase row after one row, then after two, then after four, then after eight, then 16, 32, 64, and you keep going. It's an Elizabeth Zimmerman recipe, and that's what I decided to do for the shawl. Um, I do have one more skein of yarn to wind. I am in the middle of a row because I need to wind up my last skein, but this is what I have so far. And I started with a garter tab and then I just kept track of my rows for the increase rows. I'm doing a garter stitch border and because it's all stockinette, it is flipping. I'm hoping it will block out, but I'm also not super concerned. And I will say because of the increases I'm doing, I'm just using make one left. Um, there's definitely a bit of like a ruffle after an increase row. Again, I'm hoping it will block out, but I'm not terribly worried. And so <clears throat> you can see that it's got this fade from green to gray to light gray to pink, and then it will fade to this dark red at the end. And I'm really pleased with how this, this has come out. Um, I'm knitting it on size six needles and I'm still a pretty new spinner. Um, I have noticed that in some of my recent spins, they look nice, but I don't love the texture. It's just, they're a little bit overspun and they're not as like soft and bouncy. And so I was really intentional when spinning this yarn to not overspin it and to keep it softer and fluffier. And I feel like I achieved my goal because it's pretty soft. I think it's gonna be really warm. Um, I'm just excited for how it's gonna come out, like this big semicircle, long, long gradient. Um, the idea being that, you know, I can throw it over myself on a cool evening in the fall. Um, and I think the colors are quite coastal. So I would highly recommend checking out Emily C. Jellies if you haven't yet. Um, they're a dyer in Canada and um, they do yarn as well as spinning fiber. So if you're not a spinner, you might still find something that appeals to you. Um, Emily's color palette is just soft, natural, um, some, some like fun colors too, but very much like colors that I love. Yeah, so this has been a really cool project that I had this I had the fiber and then I knew what I wanted the finished project to look like and then I spun the fiber for that finished project um, and for me that feels like it's starting to open more doorways for knitting because I'm thinking 
I can see something in my mind's eye, spin the yarn for that thing, and then figure out how to make it. And that's feeling really exciting. Um, I have a notebook right now with a lot of ideas for different things that I want to make that I will have to adapt a pattern for or write a pattern or find a recipe and adapt a recipe. Um, and I've said this before, I'm not really planning on writing patterns just because I don't really have time. I work full time. Um, and in addition to a lot of other things that take up my attention, um, but I would, if people are ever interested, I will make notes available on anything um, for free and then, and I will always talk about how I did things um, because it's pretty cool to also be like, I love following knitting patterns. I think they're amazing designers and you can change things and you can adapt things. But right now I'm in this point where I, Ooh, <laughs> we hear something. Right now I'm at this point where I studied art when I was an undergrad and I haven't really been drawing very much, um, but I'm realizing that I can use um, fiber as tools to make the things that I want to make, um, if that makes sense. <laughs> I don't know if it does. So that's feeling really cool. So because I'm more interested in spinning to knit certain projects, I have purchased some fiber, um, as I think I might have mentioned. I'm trying not to purchase yarn since I'm not knitting as much, but I spun that Emily C. Jilly's fiber, which was a gift from my father for the holidays. Um, and I have a little bit of spinning fiber left for my sweater spin, which I've kind of taken a break from. Um, but since I don't have any other fiber um, in my stash, I purchased two fibers from Mad River Fiber Mill, which is right next to Yestermaro, where I took the carpentry class. Um, and it's a really cool mill. And the woman who owns it does a lot of breed specific fibers. She'll do like washing, um, separating by color and um, prepping roving for spinning and she'll spin it into yarn. So again, if you're not a spinner, I think it's still worth checking um, Mad River Fiber Mill out. But I bought Shetland wool and Icelandic wool. And the Icelandic wool has these big old, <laughs> big ol' hairs. I'm interested to see how it spins up because, you know, the only Icelandic wool I've used is like Let Lopi. And I can tell how long the fibers are when I'm spinning it. This one is the one I've started because it just spins a little bit differently. Um, but I'm very excited also about the Shetland wool. Um, I just bought four ounces of each because I wanted to try them. But this... Yeah, I'm interested to see what spinning this is like. As I always say, I'm very amateur as a spinner. I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm pretty untrained. Um, I just do what feels natural. <laughs> Some point in time, I'm sure I will take a class. But um, as of right now, I just kind of go for it because it's working out. I make yarn that I can use and I enjoy the process. Um, but I just, I think this Shetland wool is going to be really lovely. Um... And so, yeah, I am imagining doing like a colorwork sweater or a piece with different breed specific wools that I've spun. And because the colors are pretty natural, I think it would definitely be a more subtle color work. Um, but I'm interested to sort of see what might happen. Um, so yeah, that is my only purchase. And I think that's all of the knitting content that I have for you. Um, I know that it's not that much. Um, I haven't been working on as many projects as I usually do. Um, the dress has definitely just been absorbing me and I'm feeling positively about that, which is great. Um, the backup is always going to be <laughs> that I buy a dress if it doesn't work out. Um, but 
I hope that you enjoyed seeing what I'm up to. Um, I am going to actually go outside right now and take some footage of um, what is happening in our garden. And I will put a voiceover over it um, to explain what's going on. So if you're interested, you can stick around for that. So I will see you in a minute, um, but I won't see you <laughs> in person again. So take care. I really hope you're doing well. I really always read every single comment. I don't heart them because I'm always planning to come back to respond, but I think I'm just gonna start hearting comments because everything you all say is so lovely and I just, it's really important to me. Um, again, I apologize for not being more available, but I've been working a lot in addition to sort of preparing to marry Chris. Um, who is my favorite person ever. So I'm really excited that we're getting married. Um, yeah, so I will take you outside now and I just, I hope you're taking care and enjoying July. All right, see you in a second. So as you can see, some days in the mountains, we wake up and we're just inside a cloud. It's really cool and relaxing. I'm going to take you now down to the elderberries that Chris planted last fall and they've grown so much but sadly we left the house for two days and we came back and there was a deer uh, munching on things um, which we scared away but the elderberries still look great and we actually have some more flowers even though the deer ate most of them so I think we'll have some berries this year and probably many more berries next year. At the forest edge over here, there are a lot of berries, like raspberries and blackberries, but there's also these hazelnut trees that Chris planted this year, which have grown so much. We probably won't have nuts for a few more years. But there's also these little pink champagne currants, which do have berries, and right after filming this, I ate two of the currants, and they were so delicious. They were sweet and sour. So Chris has sort of an idea to do all different types of plantings in this area, berries and nuts and fruit. You can see some of the Irish Spring soap that we nailed up because apparently deer don't like it. I also gave Chris a haircut over here because apparently deer don't like the smell of human hair. So over here we planted two apple trees, a fireside and a honey crisp so that they can pollinate each other. The honey crisp doesn't have apples this year because it bloomed too early but somehow the fireside did get pollinated and we do have apples um, and hopefully these will get a lot bigger, but they look good so far. Um, I'm really excited about the fireside apples this year and we are getting a little bit of a fungal infection, but we um, sprayed like a copper fungicide on these leaves and the apples look pretty good. Next year, the two trees should bloom at the same time and pollinate each other. Um, here you can see a little bit of leaf damage, but I think they look pretty good. Here is what we did last weekend. We planted the medicinal herb garden, and this section right here is actually a dye garden. So I'm going to use these plants, hopefully, for natural dyeing on the left is Japanese pink indigo and on the right is Dyer's chamomile. Um, I'm pretty excited to experiment with these this year. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be really cool. I would love to do a bigger dye garden. So over here are medicinal herbs and I don't remember everything that's planted. I know there's ashwagandha and yarrow and St. John's wort. I think there's some wormwood. Um, and the woman Peggy from Newfield Herbs gave me this plant called a teasel because I was talking to her about dyeing fiber and spinning. And she told me that the bristles of this plant used to be what they would use to card wool before they had modern brushes, which is where the word to tease comes from. And I thought that was so cool. Um, so yeah, there's a ton of plants here. I'll have to find a full list somewhere. Um, there's chamomile for tea. Um, and then it's right next to our big garlic bed and our garlic is almost ready to harvest. We planted hard necked garlic, which means that the flower buds, the scapes, um, we've been harvesting recently and eating. They're very delicious. If you've never tried them, I made garlic scape pesto pasta this week and it was so good. Um, and it helps the plants grow strong if you harvest the scapes. 
There are some small carrots in the corner, and this is a bed. <laughs> this was a failed experiment. I planted sunflowers and didn't water them. Yeah. Um, but Darwin is showing us over to some more fruit trees. We have these two big cherry trees that we did not plant. They are sour cherries, and you can see there's some fruit, but the birds have been getting them. And maybe next year we will put some bird netting on these trees. Um, but it's okay this year that um, most of the cherries have gotten eaten. We definitely don't mind. And we also planted a third sour cherry um, next to these two trees. But the third one definitely got eaten by the deer. And I think it's maybe getting defoliated by some bugs. Like, who's that guy? <laughs> so we're definitely going to do some organic pest management with this tree. Um, it does seem like it has some healthy leaves, though, even though I was noticing while I was looking at it that a lot of the leaves have been eaten. Um, but it looks pretty good. And here's our peach tree, which is my favorite tree. It has pretty pink blossoms, but the deer definitely was munching this. Deer love young fruit trees. And as you can see, we still have peaches, and so hopefully they will grow really big and strong. They're called contender peaches, and you can raise them up here in the north, even though we have a short growing season. We also leave part of our field unmowed. We call it the meadow, and we have lots of wildflowers there, and in the night there are so many fireflies. These are the beds behind the house. We have some leeks and bunching onions, and I just planted some more bush beans here. And then there's also an herb bed. Oh, you can see there's a lot of weeds. I need to weed these beds. I apologize. <laughs> But the kitchen herb bed has basil, it has lemon thyme, it has tarragon. Most of the things are doing okay. The dill got eaten. Um, the sage is doing well. Um, but yeah. And then here is the big garden, which we dug with the broad fork. I had mentioned that our clay is really heavy soil, so we amended it with compost, and we recently added hay to retain more moisture, and we mulched the paths. Here are the peppers and the sweet peppers and the hot peppers. Um, and, you know, we have a bunch of different pepper varieties, and some of them are already getting flowers. Behind the peppers, we have these eggplants, and we have the long, skinny ones. Um, one of them's doing really well. And then here's one of our tomatoes, and these are the pumpkins. They're cider jack pumpkins, and they really weren't doing well, but the leaves are starting to get big. Um, there's a couple beans over there, but we might actually have some pumpkins this year. Um, it will be okay if we don't have any. Um, but it's a good experiment. And then here are all of our tomatoes. We have six varieties. We have Enrosa, Torangina, Brandywine, Thorburn's Tomato, Rice Tomat, and Berry's Crazy Cherry. Um, and so I'm hoping that I can show you some of those cool tomatoes soon because some of them are rare varieties. Um, and then over here are my butternut and my honey nut squash, which I think are doing pretty well. And so I'm feeling hopeful because I would love to have some winter squash, especially because they keep so long. I've been sort of training them up this trellis. And then over here we have my cucumbers. The one with the big leaf at the bottom is market more. And then the other ones are little leaf cucumbers. And again, I didn't think they were going to do well, but they've really bounced back. I've been using fish fertilizer. Um, and they've got flowers as well. This bed had some old seeds. Um, there's some beans and some greens, but they haven't grown that well because the seeds were a bit old. Here are some greens that grew really well. They've actually bolted, which means they've gone to seed and they don't taste as good. So at some point we will probably um, replace that, but greens are really for cool weather and it's getting hotter. And then here are my soybeans, which I planted because I wanted to make tofu. I actually think this variety is better for eating fresh, um, but I'll figure it out and I'll let you know how it goes. So yeah, I didn't think that things were going to grow this much. I have been honestly really pleasantly surprised. And that's our garden tour. I hope that you enjoyed it. Um, thank you for coming along and I'm sure I will see you guys soon.